We're finishing our sermon series today on Unshakable, the life of Daniel. And one thing that I, I want to get through today, and I'm going to say this, and, and, and I want to drive it home. Hope can only be seen in hopeless situations. The only way our world is going to see true hope is when God's people are victorious through hopeless situations. Daniel had to battle eight different tests in his life for his faith. Eight different times was it brought up over and over again. He was found, and he's one of the very only ones that was brought into captivity the 70 years and was there the whole 70 years of Israel's captivity. It wasn't the same people that come up butting heads with him. It was generations after generations people brought up new faces of new people that didn't like him. And they didn't like him just because he believed in God. That was it. They didn't like him just because he had a faith in God. And his faith in God was proven because he was standing out. His professional life, he stood out because he wasn't just good at what he did to bring attention to himself. He was good at what he did because he was glorifying God in what he was doing, and that brought attention to himself. He brought attention to himself, and he stood out because of his personal character. There were certain things that he wouldn't do because of his belief in God. He stood out, and he stood out amongst the crowd because of his public commitment to God. He publicly said, I serve a risen Savior, so there are certain things I will not do. Now, I don't want you to remember their names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Belshazzar. I want you to remember these names. Daniel, God will be my judge of my life. Hananiah, Jehovah is gracious, and Jehovah is the giver. To Jehovah is going to be the one that takes care of me. Mishael, who is like my God? You see, when you're going through a hopeless situation, people are going to be drawn to the fact that you're still worshiping. You're still praising. You're still giving honor and glory to God. Even when no one else is, even when everyone else would have quit a long time ago, you're still singing praise and you're still saying, who is like my God? Because it's like the last name, Azariah, who Jehovah helps. And see, I want to give you some, some rehash and some reminder. Week one, we talked about having convictions. And, and first of all, and to come to Christ, you've got to be convicted of your sins. Know that you're a sinner. Know that there's right and wrong. And then when you're convicted of your sins and, and have conviction, then you're going to have true con conversion. And once you have true conversion, then you're going to have things that you can stand on and have conviction. And then with genuine conversion from genuine conviction. And that's when we concluded that when I depend on God, I'm unshakable. That my foundation is rooted really deep. Then we talked about adversity. We talked about 1 Peter 5 8. Be very careful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. So when you get weak, be careful. One of the reasons why we want you to come forward for prayer is when you're weak, you're vulnerable. And when you think you can handle it on your own, that's when you start messing things up. One of the strongest you can be is when you can finally get to the place where you're strong enough to say, I need help. That's not weak. That's strength. When you can finally say, I can't do it on my own. I need help. And we talked about faith under fire. Talked about the idea of testing in your faith and being isolated. And, and, you, and Satan wants you to be away from everyone else. And that's what a lion will do to its, to its prey. It'll try to get you away from the herd. Talked about indoctrination. Trying to believe something that's not true. Or compromise your beliefs. Try to just justify a little bit. Weaken what you believe in. Confusion. Maybe you don't know what you believe anymore. That's what we 
going to the idea that we build our lives on the promises of God because His Word is unbreakable, our hope is unshakable, and we do not stand on the problems of life or on the pain of life. We stand on the great and precious promises of God. God has never and will never lie to you. One of the things the Bible says that God cannot do, God cannot lie. So when he says, I will be with you always, guess what? I am with you always. Always. Point three. Last thing, talk about courage. Courage, being courageous. Standing out, being different. And I, I love this idea, this right here. But even if he does not, they wanted them to bow. They said, we're not going to bow. <coughs> Our God can save us. But even if he chooses not to, we're not going to bow. And here's the thing I like. The king says, wait a minute. We threw in three. Why is there four? And the fourth man looks like the son of God. You ever notice they don't tell us what happened to the fourth man? The three, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah, they take out of the fire. They never tell us what they did to the fourth man. There's an old song we used to listen to when I was a kid, the old quartet singing, it was, he's still in the fire. So they were going to talk about Daniel in the lion's den, and the thing was, in the lion's den, the angel of God came and sent them out to Daniel. Here's something I like that the Bible says. It didn't say that God's going to take you out of the lion's den. God's not going to take you out of the fire. But guess what? My God will get down in there with you. He got in the fire with the men. He got in the lion's den with Daniel when he was in the lion's den. We have a God who gets there with you alongside you when things are going bad. That's the kind of God that we serve. That kind of God. Today we want to talk about the idea. It still takes courage. But let me give you a timeline on Daniel that maybe you don't understand. When he was taken into captivity, he was 15 years old. Maybe 17 years old. That age group. This age group right here. Now, I told them this morning, I got the privilege to teach them this morning. And, and Kelly has a hard job. I mean, I, I, these, these kids scare me. I mean, youth scare me to death. Uh, they, they, they're staring at me right now. I don't, you know, stony cold. I think they play poker a lot. I mean, they just, no expression. They just kind of like that. Uh, it, it's just, I don't know about them anymore. They just, it's just different. And it just kind of bothered me a little bit. But they're here in church. They showed up to Sunday school class. They read scripture. They, they, they talked to me. We, we kind of talked over scripture. They're coming tonight at 5 o'clock. All right, they're going to come tonight at 5 o'clock. I teach them again. I'm impressed. At 17 and 19 years old, that's when Daniel interpreted the dream. Remember what he said? I can't do it, but I know God can. The kind of faith that he had. And last week we talked about the fire and furnace. They were in their mid 30s. You see, the life of Daniel shows us that we're going to be hit constantly. Today we're talking about him in the lion's den. He was 81, 83 years old. How many here are over 75? How many over 75 years old have a fight between their body and their brain? Their brain says one thing and their body says something else. Your brain says, oh, you can still run a mile, and your body says, do it and die, family. <laughs> Anybody, how many at the age of 50 are having that fight right now? 50 year old. Yeah, the hands go up. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, your body's going, you can't do that no more. 80 years old. His whole life. And here's the reason why he had to battle all his life. Because God loves humanity. God died for humanity. And Satan hates what God loves. So Satan hates you. And Satan's going to try to tear you down, tear you apart, rip you to shreds. And the reason is because God loves you. The whole reason, the only reason that Satan hates you is because of God's love. This past week I got the opportunity to teach a one and something broke my heart. We were doing Romans 8, 38, 39. 
What can possibly separate us from the love of God? Shall hardships or persecution, famine or nakedness, peril of swords, shall angels or demons? No, I am convinced neither height nor depth or anything in all creation can separate us from the love that's found in Christ Jesus. So, <clears throat> even those that are in hell today are still loved by God. Have you thought about that? God loved them. He loved them. And they rejected me. I've seen parents that love their kids, but the parents the kids don't love them back. And the parents would do anything for those kids. They're just heartbroken. Would, would help them in any way they can. But the love doesn't get returned. And I just see that. It just breaks my heart. And that's how God's relationship with, with us, with humankind. God loves us, but we don't love him back. And there are people in hell because they would not accept God's love. But he still loves them. So here he is, 80 years old, and he's living in the lion's den. Everybody around him ridicules him just because of who he is. And Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 says, Now Daniel was so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps, and by exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over all the other kingdoms. At this time, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in the conduct of the governing affairs. But were unable to do so. They could not find any corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Now let me ask you this. What do you think the other guys were like then? They were trying to figure out if he was like them. And they're like, hey, this boy ain't like the rest of us. They were putting money in their pocket. They weren't being trustworthy. They were lying to the king. And, hey, this guy ain't like the rest of us. There's nothing we can find fault with him. And finally, what they said is this. The fact that these men concluded, we will never find any basis of charges against Daniel unless it is something to do with his God. In the New Testament, Peter says, live such good lives among the pagans, the non-believers, that when they come to judge your life, and guess what? If you're a Christian, guess what the world's going to do? They're going to judge you. And he says, bring it. A Christian shouldn't ask people not to judge him. A Christian should say, bring it. Live such good lives among the pagans that when they come to judge you, that they will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Wow. We've not got to the end of this story yet. <coughs> the only thing they could find fault with Daniel was his relationship with his God. And they decided to make a law that he could only pray to make king their king. Now let me tell you this, Daniel lived through four different kings. This is King Darius. The next king we're going to talk about is King Sarah. If we're not going to talk about him, you go home and read about him. But four different kings, and Daniel was found faithful to serve every foreign king. Every king, he was the same person day in and day out. They said, you can't pray to anybody but the king. Daniel said, you know what? You do what you need to do, and I'm going to do what I need to do. When I was a kid, there was a movie that came out. It was a B-class movie called No Retreat, No Surrender. If you ever get a chance to watch it, love that movie. No retreat, no surrender. That's the way we've got to live our lives as Christians. You can't fight Satan with your backside. If you ever look at the weapons and the army of God, the armor of God, there's nothing that protects your backside. You fight Satan full form, head on. And I like what it says here. Three times a day, look at that last thing, sentence. Three times a day, Daniel got down on his knees. Eighty years old. Got down on his knees. You talk about an act of faith. That boy had to get back up again. Eighty years old, got down on his knees. And look what he prayed giving thanks. He's in the middle of getting ready to be punished. Giving thanks just as he had done. Before. He didn't even change his prayer life. You do what you need to do, and I'm going to do what I need to do. If you're going to put me in jail, so be it. If you're going to do whatever you're going to do, I don't care what it is. I've got to serve my God. And look what this says. These men were waiting to catch him. They fell down and praying and asking for God for help. You know what Daniel was asking God for help was? Lord, help him stay faithful. It wasn't get me out of this mess. Our prayers today is God get me out of the mess. No. His prayer was, Lord, help me to stay faithful. 
The New Testament church in the book of Acts, what was their prayer? Find me faithful. When persecution comes, make me rise to the occasion. That was Daniel's prayer. Lord, help me to rise to the occasion. Keep me faithful. Eighty years old, help me to rise to the occasion. Here's what we find about the life of Daniel. God knows you. Now just wrap your head and think about that for a minute. God knows you. And in the midst of your struggles, you need to recognize God's in the midst of the struggle with you. When you're in the fiery furnace and all hell is breaking loose in your life, you need to recognize God's there in the midst of it. Whenever things are going all, all crazy in your life, you're not alone. And if you're feeling alone, that's what we're talking about praying with you today. If you're feeling alone, don't feel alone. There's no sense in it. You're not alone. When you leave here today, and you look into somebody's eyes, and you can tell when somebody has that feeling, you need to look right in their eyes and say, you're not alone. They need to know. God's in the midst of our struggle. He knows us. <laughs> I, I uh, asked this question this morning, and, and see, we had, a, we had a sweetheart banquet at the last church, and, and we only invited people that were married, and and we had a, a newlywed game, and then we asked these questions, and, and you got points. And one of the questions was, you had to know what submarine races were. And my wife was the only one that knew what they were. Don't look like so confused, Sharon. You know what they are. Does anybody here know what it means when you're going to watch the submarine races? A preacher's wife knows what it means. Imagine that. It means you're going down to the lake to make out, Sharon. <laughs> Gail ready. <Woo! laughs> Take your vitamins with you, Gail. <laughs> Notice a preacher button you want to live. Remember dating? I'll give you a minute, Jim. Bye. When I was a kid, I always thought it was funny. We used to have what they call the bench seat in all the vehicles. And, and the people sit so close together, it almost looked like there was one person in the car. Remember what I mean? They drive down the road, and it was, it was almost like a one-seater. You know, and, and they'd get so close together, and they'd, they'd hug on each other, and they'd sit in the car, and they'd, they'd hold each other's hands, and they'd walk down the road. It was just sick. You know what I mean? Just nasty stuff. But dating is to know each other, to get to know each other. And then, you know, they'd stop by and he'd pick her up some flowers, something that she'd like, or, or she'd make him a special dessert, peach cobbler, whatever, you know, something, whatever it is. But they'd get to know each other intimately. God knows you. Like no one else does. And he wants you to know him. He wants you to know that he, he loves you. He loves you. He didn't die for some tree. He didn't die for some animal. He died for you. And if, if you were the only one on the face of the earth, he would still just die for you. He knows you. He knows what, what makes you hurt. And the Bible says that every time you cry, now think about this, the book of Psalms says every time you cry, he catches your tears and he collects them. That not one tear is wasted. Some of you go off and hide. You don't think anybody is paying attention. God's paying attention. He knows you. He knows you like no one else knows you. And he's listening and he hears you. You're not struggling alone. But also he wants to grow us. And you know the life growing hurts. My boys are going through the age of voices changing. And I laugh and I laugh. But one of these days they're going to put that under the key to the car. And I don't laugh no more. I went to work out with them over the wintertime and, and we were working out at the school gym and I'm sitting there lifting weights and I look over at Brent. And I've got on the yellow 25 pound weights, and he's got on the red 45, and I've got on one on each side, and he's got two on each side, big present. And I'm sitting there, and I've got it on my chest going, good Lord, I've got to die. I can't get it off my chest. And Lucas comes over and says, would you help your dad? And I'm like, don't help me. OK, 
okay, just a little. And, you know, get it off, get it off, get it off, get it off. I said, Lucas, can we paint mine orange so at least it looks like I'm doing the same thing you're doing? They're growing. And growing hurts. Remember the first time your kids learned to walk and they fell and they got bumps and bruises on them? Man, growing as a Christian hurts and, and grow, God, do you think it felt good to be in a fiery furnace? Do you think Daniel enjoyed at 80 years old being thrown in a lion's den? Do you think it was all, you know, just roses and all beautiful. But God wants us to grow. And let's be honest, growing hurts. It, it, it's not fun. It, it, it is heartbreaking. And you're, you're a parent, and, and you've been at that stage where you're, you're, your kids are growing up, and, and one of these days they're going to go off to college, if they're not yet, and as they go off to college, and they're going to they're going to have their own family, and they're going to move away, and then you're only going to see them maybe on special occasions, and then the special occasions get few and far between, and you don't see them as much, and, and they grow. Growing hurts. Sometimes as you grow, you, you've got to confront issues. In marriages, if you don't confront an issue, it gets worse. In, 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 in church, if you don't confront issues, they're going to get worse. You've got to Part of growing is through confrontation. You don't like it, but you've got to do it. And here's something you've got to say in the bottom line of this. God's going to get glory out of this. When they were in the fiery furnace, what did they say? Our God can do this, but even if he don't, to God be the glory. Daniel in the lion's den, to God be the glory. In the situation you find yourself in, that's what you've got to be in. You've got to force yourself to say, to God be the glory, great things he has done. He is going to get glory in this despite me. Somehow, some way, I'm going to be able to say, God's going to get the glory. God's going to not me. God's going to get the glory. In the crisis, I love when you look in the Bible, God always sends the best men, the best women, into the problem. He sends in the very best. In your situation, you've got to say, God is counting on me. I'd hate to be a kicker in a football game. You're always counting on the kicker. I always thought it was funny because he's always a little rough, but you always count on the kicker. You know that? <laughs> you always count on the kicker. The Bears counted on the kicker last year, and now they're counting on a new one. <clears throat> Side you know. Just think about that for a minute. Preacher, I failed. Yeah, you did. We have a God who's going to stay by your side anyway. The preacher, I didn't stay strong in the line then. I didn't stay strong in the fiery furnace. But we have a God who's going to stay by your side. We have a God who's going to pick you up. Dust you off, put you back on your feet. The next verb, look at verse 20. When he came near the den, this is the king, he called out to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continued, been able to rescue you from this impossible, impossible, hopeless situation. Hope is only seen in hopeless situations.
can only be seen in helpless situations. You remember 9-11, some of you. Hopeless. Until someone, some firefighter, dropped a flag and they sparked our hope. Until the Boston Red Sox players from running out on the field holding flags in their hands. It sparked our hope that it made us fight again. It made us live again. When they took away everything that we were wanting to live again, and some of us have this feeling right here. You feel like you're trapped in that hopeless situation. You don't see the hope. If it, if there, if there is no light. It's all gone. So did Daniel. It was totally shut down. But he goes and he says this. But God sent his angel and he shut the mouth of the lions. I'm not even got lit last night. The God whom I serve did more than save me. Faith is not the absence of emotion. It's the presence of hope. There's never a picture of Christianity, it's that one right there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in there. He makes me to lie down in the greenest of pastures. My provisions have been met. He takes me beside the sweetest of waters. <coughs> and when it's dark, he restores my soul. Verse 4 of that. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I've got wolves prowling all around me, biting and yelling and screaming and hollering all, all around me. I will not fear. For his rod and his staff, they comfort me. We have a God who stays with us. If you get nothing from being unshakable, your God is unshakable. Your God will stay by you through thick and thin. Even when you fail and you let others down, and maybe you let yourself down, and, and you feel like you've let the world down, and you, you've caused the world to crumble, don't worry. You have a God who will stay by your side who will pick up the pieces and put everything all back together. Who's going to shake the wolves off. Who's going to make everything okay. He's got a God who can fix it. Let me ask you this. Why do the Lord? Why not let his power take control? I heard a man say this, we serve an intense God who does intense things. He doesn't make bad people good, he makes dead people alive. <clears throat> you have a God who stays. You have a God who stays. And what are you going through in your life? that you need to throw off. You feel like you're going through a fiery furnace right now and the flames are just eating you up? You feel like maybe you're in the lion's den and they're just devouring you and you just, you just can't handle it. Maybe you need to run to the shepherd, curl up in his arms. Let him fight for you. He's never lost a battle. 
I'm with you always. I'm with you always. And I'll be with you always. We have a God who stays by your side. 